Good morning. Welcome to uh, our worship gathering here of Southside Baptist Church. Uh, my name is Joy Morrison. I'm one of the pastors here at Southside. <clears throat> so we welcome everyone watching, uh, our visitors. We're glad you're with us. And uh, we hope that um, when all this is done and we're, we're open back up and can physically meet together, that you will join us for one of our services. But we're glad you're with us. We in no way want to look at this as a replacement of what uh, that physical gathering means. Uh, I'll talk about that in the message today, about the importance of that uh, physical gathering to be able to see each other's faces and, and have that personal relationship with one another to encourage each other in, in our faith. But, uh, but this is the best we can do for now. But again, thank you for being with us. Members, uh, we're, uh, I wish I could see your faces. Um, it's been good to catch up with some of you uh, on, uh, through phone calls and text messages. Uh, let's continue to, to look out for each other. And let me just stress the importance of you listening or watching this, this video uh, uh, and, and watching the, the message. Uh, there, there are certainly uh, other pastors out there who are much more gifted than I am that you could listen to. But, you know, in every local church, the Lord is doing something unique. He is doing it uh, through, through the uh, our unique relationships we have with each other, and that unique message uh, and that, we, that we listen to uh, and study God's Word together through uh, each and every week. And so, um, so this is an important time for us, even though we can't be together um, as we would like. So again, let me just encourage you in that. And again, it's good, good, to, um, it's good to, to be here uh, for, another, for another worship service. Uh, we're going to start with a song, uh, and uh, it is Praise the Savior, one that we're all familiar with as we think about how lost we were and just giving praise to, to Christ for saving us from our sins. Uh, let, me, let me pray, and then we will begin. Father, thank you. We praise you for your grace on us um, and uh, grace <clears throat> that saves us, grace that gives us a desire to, to worship you. So bless our time now, and we trust this in your hands, and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All my sin was so contagious All
Please pray with me once again. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to hear and learn from your word this morning. Thank you that we still have the freedom and opportunity to read and to study it and to encourage one another with it, especially during this time, using the means that you've given us today. Lord, your word is pure like honey and refreshing like water. It revives our souls. So may we not treat it as dessert, but as our daily bread. Forgive us for allowing ourselves to be distracted and disoriented by our temporary situation now, when you are the one who has ordained it. Instead of asking what you want to teach us through this, we're asking when it's going to be over. Forgive us for our short-sightedness and lack of patience. Continue to reveal the sin in our lives that may have been brought to light this week, as many of us remain sheltered in our homes. May we use this time not to become weary and complacent, but to grow in faith and knowledge and to throw off the sin that so easily entangles us. Help us to be redeeming these days, to pause and reflect on our lives in a new way, to count our blessings rather than counting our losses. And the fact is, everything that makes us need you more is a blessing. Lord, help us to appreciate your patience with us, the stubborn and hard-headed people that we are. So much in our lives is unworthy of your mindfulness, and we are so richly deserving of your rejection and condemnation, but your gifts and calling can never be taken away. And you discipline us out of love. So help us to receive it in this way. To do all things without grumbling or complaining. So that we might shine as lights in this dark world. Remind us that as your word says, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. Give us the strength to bear one another's burdens as we check on and build each other up through this ongoing pandemic. I also pray for those who are struggling and recovering from health issues so they can rest in your sovereign grace. And we lift up our government to you. We pray that we won't fear or put our trust in them, but ultimately to place our faith in the fact that you have them in this temporary position of authority for reasons beyond our limited understanding. And we are to respect them. We are to obey them as much as we are not in sin. And we are to trust them as you have put them there. Help us to be anxious for nothing, but to make all our requests known to you each day. Teach us to fear you alone, which is the beginning of wisdom. And sanctify us so that we might love you more and be satisfied in the greatness and the joy of your steadfast love for us, your children. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Matt. If everyone will turn in their Bibles to Mark chapter 2, we'll pick back up in our study in Mark chapter 2, last time we left off in verse 12. So today we'll be reading verses 13 through 17, Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. 
Let's read. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. May God bless the reading of his word. It's been a a couple weeks since we were in Mark's gospel last, so let me begin with a a short review. I titled our whole study of Mark's gospel, Following Jesus, because the book is about Jesus and what it means to follow Jesus, hence following Jesus. The first half of the book is about Jesus' ministry in Galilee and is really the basics about who Jesus is and who his followers are to be. And the second half of the book, beginning in chapter 8, verse 31, focuses on the suffering of Christ and the cost a follower is called to in following Jesus. That's the basic structure of the book, two main halves, really. And so in chapter 1, as we dive into the basics about following Jesus, we get a little introduction into who Jesus is and his purpose in coming. Everything has been pretty smooth thus far. Uh, the, the only problem has been dealing with being so popular. <laughs> That's maybe not too bad. But in chapter 2, things begin to change. It's kind of like how a political campaign can sometimes start off. It's fairly easy in the beginning as people are just getting to, to know the candidate, but then it gets more challenging as their policies get more closely examined. And so we see that here. In chapter 2, we have four stories of Jesus, and and in each each one, there is a question from the religious leaders and others asking why. In verse 7, they asked why Jesus thought he could forgive sin. We covered that a couple weeks ago. In verse 18, uh, why do Jesus' disciples not fast? In verse 24, why is Jesus not observing the Sabbath as the religious leaders prescribe? And in verse 16 of our passage today, Jesus is asked why he eats with tax collectors and sinners. And so that is our focus today. Why did Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why did he associate with them? The context of that question is that Jesus had gone out beside the sea Sea of Galilee, that's where most of his ministry and uh, first half of Mark is, is around the Sea of Galilee, and he was teaching the crowds that followed him there. He was mostly restricted to ministering outside the towns due to the the size that the crowds had become that were following him. And, And at some point, he walked past a guy named Levi that we also know in the Gospels as Matthew. And he was sitting at a tax booth, meaning he was a tax collector. Now, tax collectors were considered the scum of the earth to Jewish people. They were typically Jews themselves who were working for the Roman government to collect taxes from their fellow citizens. For the Jews, they believed that uh, Roman occupation of their land was illegitimate in the first place, and a fellow Jew collecting taxes for Roman for Rome was equal to treason. But then on top of that, these tax collectors often added additional unnecessary fees to the taxes to make themselves personally wealthy. And in Jewish religious writings, they were lumped in with thieves and murderers. They were even disqualified as a witness in court proceedings and expelled from the Jewish synagogue. And they were considered a disgrace to their families. And so Jesus walks up to one of these characters, Levi, and calls him to follow him. 
and he does. Next in, they go to Levi's home, and Jesus reclines with Levi and, and has a meal. But now there are a number of others who have joined them who are obviously considered on the same level of low life as Levi and are referred to as tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus and his disciples are hanging out with them and sharing a meal together. And on top of that, Mark says that these tax collectors and sinners are following Jesus now too. Following here doesn't mean just following him around wherever he goes. It means following as disciples. In other words, they were, they were joining this movement. And so this leads to the, to the scribes of the Pharisees, the religious leaders, approaching and asking Jesus' disciples why Jesus was doing this. Why was he eating with these lowlifes, these sinful, wicked people? And overhearing it, Jesus replies first with a proverb, those who are well have no need of a physician, but but those who are sick. And then he applies it to his purpose in coming. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So at the heart of this passage is the question, why does Jesus eat with sinners? And Jesus' answer is because that's who he came to save. Now, after Jesus' words are summed up, uh, I'm sorry, oftentimes Jesus' words are, are summed up as what a person does if he wants to reach lost people. You know, you've got to go to where they are, hang out with them, and try to reach them. But I think this answer, I think Jesus' answer here in this passage runs much deeper than that. I think the real issue here strikes at the very heart of what it means for Jesus to save sinners. And I have two answers from this text that I want to share with you and explain. First, saving sinners means a right relationship with God. Jesus is providing sinners a right relationship with God. Secondly, Saving sinners means nothing is deserved. Our salvation and right standing with God is is undeserved, free grace. So those are our two points that we want to flesh out here from this text. So first, saving sinners means a right relationship with God. I think for many of us, if we were to be honest, we would have to admit a little bit of uneasiness with verse 15 in particular. We get verse 14. In fact, it very, it very much parallels the previous chapter when Jesus calls the first four disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. But even there, the first thing Jesus says to them after calling them to follow him is that he will make them fishers of men. It even says that James and John left their father. So the episode seems to speak of sacrifice from the very beginning. So we can relate. Sure, a follower of Jesus will have have to sacrifice and give up much. That sounds right to us, perhaps in our own self-righteous tendencies. But then we come to verse 15 in in this passage. And this scene of Jesus reclining with a bunch of tax collectors and sinners. You you might might imagine in our modern day, guys coming over to Jesus and putting one arm around Jesus' neck and with their other hand holding up a camera and and taking a selfie and sending it out to their followers saying, hey, hanging out with Jesus. There seems to be something just a little off with this whole scene. What, what, What we need is a little more evidence to the fact that these people have all seen their sin and turned from it before all of this fellowship with Jesus begins. Kind of like Zacchaeus. If you remember the story about Zacchaeus, who was another tax collector in Luke chapter 19. When Jesus comes to his house, he, he commits, Zacchaeus commits to paying back those he had cheated fourfold and giving away half of his, of his possessions to the poor. Then Jesus declares Zacchaeus's salvation. Yet there's very little of that here in Mark. But folks, that I believe is on purpose. There is meant to be a level of shock 
at the love and grace and acceptance that Jesus shows these low lives. In fact, the word sinners is properly translated wicked. These were horrible people. Now, unfortunately, in our day and time, we have grown accustomed to being sympathetic to, to bad people. Many of our movies and TV shows today are centered around the anti-hero. The show takes you into their personal story so that you understand better where they are coming from, what were their motivations. They, they may share some of your own inward struggles that you just haven't been willing or had the guts to act on yourself as they did. And so you find yourself in these, in these stories pulling for people like drug dealers and, and murderers. But, but folks, that's make-believe. In, in real life, we would not want to know these people. We would be afraid of them. We might struggle with bitterness towards how they have treated us or a loved one. We might pray for one of those imprecatory psalms we find in the Old Testament uh, asking for God to, to judge them. Yet, that is who Jesus is eating with and enjoying a time of fellowship. So why? Why? Because at the heart of the gospel, folks, the heart of Jesus' purpose to come into the world was to restore horrible, wicked people to a right relationship with him. We should not be surprised at Jesus calling this, these horrible people to himself and loving them. That's the point. Jesus came to make people right with God. Sin has separated all people from God. These tax collectors and sinners represent all of us. And sin demands God's justice and eternal judgment. So Jesus came to remove sin, to pay for it in his own death on the cross. He died as a, as a substitute, taking the punishment that we deserved, that you deserved for your sin. And now that your sin is paid for, that all the requirements of God's law have been met in Jesus, God is now able to, to, to have a relationship with us. You see, Jesus didn't die just to give you forgiveness. Perhaps when we read here of Jesus calling Levi to follow him, our image is that Levi would, would do, that, do that very thing, sim simply follow, that he would kind of fall in line with the rest of the pack, walking a few steps behind Jesus maybe, trying to keep up, trying to prove himself now that he's a follower, trying to show that his, his faith is genuine and this sort of thing. But instead... We have Jesus reclining at a table with Levi and perhaps enjoying Levi's company, listening to Levi, laughing at something Levi says or answering questions Levi might ask, acting as if Levi was very important to him. But this should not surprise us, folks. This is all part of who God is. God is a God of relationship. He, he has eternally existed as one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, knowing the joy of their love and, 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 and relationship with God, with, with each other, I'm sorry, with each other. And, and God created humankind in His, His, His own image to, to know that same love and joy of relationship with God and their fellow humanity. That's part of what makes this whole coronavirus so difficult. It takes away something so essential to all of us, to our very existence. We need relationship. Social media is just not enough. We need to be able to, to, to look at people in person, to touch and embrace. And probably the worst Part of all this is the idea of people having to die alone out of fear of 
loved ones, family members, others catching this. People having to die alone, no one there to hold their hand in their last moments. This virus is just exemplifying the results of sin and the fall. It separates us from each other and most of all from God. And so as 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Not just for us to enjoy God, but for God to enjoy us. You may be a, a sinner, but if you are in Christ, you are one of God's beloved that he rejoices over as Christ rejoiced over these tax collectors and sinners who followed him. That brings us to our second point. Christ saving sinners means nothing is deserved. Again, as we mentioned before in verse 15, it is a little shocking for all of Verse 15 is a little shocking for all of us. There is little sign of conversion other than Levi leaving the tax booth. And there is absolutely nothing in reference to all of these other tax collectors and sinners other than the phrase that there were many who followed him. And so that is the point of these scribes and Pharisees. Why is Jesus associating with them? In Jewish culture, a respectable Jew would not associate with people like this, and, res- and especially a, a religious leader or teacher like Jesus was uh, becoming. So, so was, was Jesus promoting here uh, what we sometimes call easy believism? Uh, was he so determined to create a movement that he was willing to make it as easy as possible on people and ignore their sin? Uh, we, see, we see a lot of that today in, in the church, of course, uh, put on a good show, talk about positive things, and just leave it to the individual to figure out that sin part on their own. Well, no, that is not what Jesus is promoting. But what he is promoting sounds almost as scandalous. What he is promoting is grace. Full-blown, pure, 100 proof, unconditional, unmerited in any way, shape, or form, grace. We do nothing to deserve it. What Jesus is showing us here with the use of these low lives is that the way to God has nothing to do with what we can do, but completely in what Christ has done for us. Jesus is showing that these sinners' way to God has nothing to do with their behavior and everything to do with God and His mercy. We need this passage, folks. We need this passage. More and more people are misunderstanding and distorting what grace is. That's why more and more I I add the word free to, to grace when I, when I talk about it, free grace, it's actually redundant, okay? I mean, it's, it should be understood in the word grace that it's free. But, but, but you, can, you can tell people that Jesus saves by grace alone, and they still don't get it. It's, it's ingrained in our nature to think we've got to do something to cause God to love us and accept us, and even to continue to be good to us. But folks, there's not. There's nothing that we do. Anything that had to be done was done by God. And the reason it must be this way is because of how corrupt natural man's heart is. We, 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 we would never choose God on our own, not truly choose Him, We may choose to be religious and do good things. There's lots of people out there like that. But Romans 8 teaches that there is no one who truly seeks after God 
and believes in God without grace. And so it is with Levi here. And, and, and the hope and the assurance of the Christian life is that the Bible teaches God gives grace to assure everything that must take place to save a person. Romans 8.30 teaches us that, that, that God predestined our lives to assure our salvation. He, he, he planned it out to make sure our salvation was accomplished and, and, and that, he, that he gives grace even to, to that calling like, like we see with Levi here, that, that when Jesus calls him, that changes our hearts within, does a, a supernatural work within our hearts, that changes our, our attitude towards God and irresistibly draws us to Christ in faith. And even after, become, after, even after being saved, that, that God gives us grace so that we persevere in our faith and won't turn away. Philippians 2.13 says that, that God works in the believer so that we desire and act according to God's good purposes. And so it is okay that Jesus shows such affirmation of these tax collectors and sinners when they show so little evidence up to this point of their conversion because the hope and assurance of a person's faith is not ultimately in them. Yes, we look for evidence of a changed life, certainly, to see the genuineness of a person's salvation. But the Bible teaches that. But that is still not what we put our ultimate hope in. Because even on our best day, folks, our good works fall so short. No, our confidence must be in God's free grace. That is what saves and keeps us saved. We must trust that. We must trust that He simply won't let us fail when He pours out His grace on us. He's not going to let us fail. That's our confidence. And so that then is what leads to the conflict here with these scribes. You see, central to their faith was the observance of the law of the Old Testament. Now, I think in the, in the past we have perhaps misrepresented the scribes and Pharisees to a certain extent. We have taught that, that they were literally just trying to earn their way to heaven by obeying the law. And, and, that, is, and that is perfectly true. I mean, I'm sorry, partly true. Yet, they would, they, would, they would not have denied grace. My point is they would not have denied grace. They, they believed that the Jews, the Jewish people, their place with God was given by, by God's grace. They were God's chosen people. God affirms in Deuteronomy 7 that he did not choose them because of anything good in them. Yet where the scribes fell in error was a legalism that we could all fall prey to as well. We may believe that we are saved by grace, but for God to continue to be pleased with us, to be pleased with me, to love me, I must obey Him. And in that moment, in that thought, we can go from trusting in grace to trying to earn God's continued. What the scribes needed to grasp and what we need to make sure we grasp is that we in no way control our standing with God in being saved or staying saved. That is why they are so judgmental towards the tax collectors and sinners. To the scribes, these tax collectors had been given grace in being a Jew, but had not been faithful in keeping it. These, these scribes felt a, a self-righteousness in their keeping of the grace that had been given them, evidenced in their obedience to the law. They could say, We're, we have obeyed, so we are, we are righteous. But grace doesn't work that way, folks. Our salvation and standing with God is all of grace. 
It is a complete act of love on God's part where we are only the recipients, where even our faith and obedience are gifts of God's grace, His supernatural work in us. As Philippians 1, 6 says, He who began a good work in us is faithful to complete it. He starts it and He brings it to brings it through to fruition. He completes it. That is the gospel. And so now with that, let me close our time with some application and conclusions in light of what we've just discussed. Number one, confess and renounce all self-righteousness and spiritual pride. The gospel teaches us that there is no reason to boast in in anything. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says, By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Paul teaches us that any good that comes out of our life is by grace. You, you, you are, you, myself, we are no better than the worst of sinners. Think of, and so, and so think of the last five people you have gotten angry or frustrated with or criticized. And then remind yourself that you are not one bit better than those people. Not to your own credit. <laughs> If you are right and they are wrong, it is by grace alone. So pray for them and love them. And with that in general, love sinners. Oh, praise God for His love for us sinners. We we have no way of knowing who God will save All we can do is is love those God puts before us or lays on our hearts and teach them as Jesus taught the crowds in verse 13. Teach them the gospel. No no telling how many actually believe, if any. But but we teach the gospel. We pray for them. And we extend, and we 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 need to extend our reach, even to those who might be very different from us. They, they, They may be of a different race, sexual orientation or even political party, but they need Jesus too. Might these be the people Jesus would have approached and called to follow him in our day? Of course, we may be limited to some extent during this pandemic, but use this time to prepare yourself once these things end. Thirdly, Folks, if if our faith and our obedience are all a work of grace, it it, it was that that God ultimately accomplished it by His grace, then the key to the growth of a believer's faith, the growth of our faith, is in coming to a greater dependence on Christ and His grace. Understanding His grace and love for us in deeper and deeper ways. You know, now it it, it is actually understanding grace more deeply and His love for us is actually the motivating factor and power behind obedience. Yes, obedience is important, but, but but not possible in our own strength. Some believers make the mistake of thinking that focusing more on the love and mercy of God will cause us to be less obedient, more more lax. But no, it's just the opposite. Less confidence and hope in God's love and grace is what leads to sin. The more confident I am in the grace of God, the less I will fear my sin and the less I will feel a need for my sin. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare 
his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not, along with him, graciously give us all things? It is confidence, folks, in, the, in, in what Christ has done for us, his, his love, his commitment to us that is absolute, complete, that gives us confidence that God will take care of all of our needs, especially my sin. So keep pressing in. Keep seeking the Lord to know His promises to you. Be in the Word in order to know the nourishment of His promises of grace to you. During this stay-at-home time, call a brother or sister in Christ and, and discuss the Scriptures together. Find all the encouragement you can from God's Word, from His promises to you in Christ. There is our strength. That is what leads to greater faith and greater obedience. Now let me hit on another thing there I just mentioned, calling on a brother or sister. I'm, I'm really concerned, actually, that the longer this social distancing goes on, the more discouraged folks can get. The church, the gathering, is commanded by God as a means of grace to us to encourage one another according to Hebrews 10. So we've got to, to make sure we're finding alternative ways to meet. So get with someone again over the phone. Don't wait on someone to call you. Call them. I know someone should have already called you, sure, but you should have called them too. <laughs> so you're even. So call. Call, encourage, and get the encouragement that you need in the Lord through your brothers and sisters. Finally, rejoice in Christ's love for you by loving him back. I go back to the image of Jesus in this text, reclining with these people. He found pleasure in his relationship with them and they with him. At this time where perhaps our movement is limited, let us learn to simply enjoy time with the Lord, fellowship with Him. That's what we are to do for all eternity, folks. That's what we are to be pre being prepared for. Our sanctification, the grace God is working in us to grow us in Him is, is preparing us for eternity where we will be in the presence of Christ forever. And this picture here in this passage is a picture of what should be taking place forever. Christ enjoying us and we enjoying him, loving each other in the bond that was established by his grace through his blood for us. And if there's anyone here, anyone listening, who does not know that love, does not know that, know that grace. The Bible teaches that he turns no one away. He comes to him by faith. That faith is the evidence of God's supernatural grace working in you that, that, that is drawing you to him. You see, if you see you're a sinner in need of a savior, if you, see, if you understand that, if you can see that, believe on Jesus this day. And again, contact us and let us help you further. And with that, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your free grace that you have poured out on us. Thank you for your love. Lord, it did not love us based on our achievements, but our lack thereof. We ran from you, Father. We rebelled against you. You pursued us by your grace and paid the ultimate cost through your son who gave his life as a sacrifice to ransom, ransom us, to, to save us, to restore us to a right relationship with you. It is, that is where our, our confidence stands, that we have been given credit. Through faith, we've been given credit for Christ's righteousness. And you love us you love us completely and absolutely and eternally. Thank you, Father. Continue to give us grace to grow in that understanding of your great love for us, that it would, it would, it would cause us, our worship, to be 
more God glorifying, more joyful for us. And, uh, and Father, that it would be overflowing as well. And we could be that light for those around us. That they would see in our relationship to you that uh, their need for you. And they would, they would come to you. So, Father, bless us. Bless our church. Um, we love you. We pray this in your precious son's name. Amen.